Hello and welcome to St Michael and All Angels Church and the Chiswick Book Festival. This event was organised many, many months ago and was due to take place in the wonderful theatre over the road at Arts Ed, which we thought was a very appropriate place uh, to celebrate Harold Pinter. We're delighted uh, that despite COVID, uh, Antonia Fraser and Michael Billington have been undaunted and are here to remember the great playwright and albeit without an audience, a live audience. Before I welcome them both, I'd like to explain why we wanted to hold this event at this time. As many of you know, the festival has established a Chiswick Writers' Trail and a Chiswick timeline of writers and books. And one of the most illustrious names on it is Harold Pinter, who, with W.B. Yeats, is one of two Nobel Prize winners who have lived in Chiswick. The play that made Pinter's name was The Caretaker. And as Michael makes clear in his biography, it was written in and based on events in the flat in Chiswick High Road where Pinter was living. It's 60 years since the first production of The Caretaker. It's 15 years since Harold Pinter was awarded the Nobel Prize and he would have been 90 next month. So it seems highly appropriate to celebrate his life and work here today. And we could have no better people to do so than Antonia and Michael. Thank you, welcome. Antonio, you launched the very first Chiswick Book Festival back in 2009. You were here on the first day. You were speaking about the 40th anniversary edition of Mary, Queen of Scots. Do you remember that occasion? Very well. I remember enjoying it like, like mad and thinking this is lovely because I only live up the road. I thought, you know, any time this festival wants me to come down the road, I'm there. So here I am. Well, we were very honoured because I remembered at the end you said, what a beautiful church and what intelligent questions. And we all preened ourselves. You probably say that to all book festival audiences, but for us, what? this was... I, yeah. I, I wouldn't dream of ever <laughs> saying anything <laughs> insincere, would I, Michael? Not at all, no. <laughs> no. And Michael has been a Chiswick resident for over 50 years, I think? Or Since 1976. Since 1976. You're Harold Pinter's biographer. Uh, you retired in December after a very distinguished career as, um, uh, as the Guardian's theatre critic. And you went to all those productions from here in Chiswick. That was your routine. My routine was to set off, yes, from where I live, down um, off Strand on the Green, night after night after night for all my working life. Are you missing all that? Well, of course, it's strange because there's nothing to miss at the moment. Because of the lockdown and theatres being closed, it, it's as if you know, the whole raison d'etre of my existence has gone anyway. Uh, but once the theatres do start functioning again, yes, of course, I will miss it desperately. So your timing was immaculate? Well, I wouldn't say that. But <laughs> it was unfortunate in a way, actually. As soon as I stopped, the theatres closed. Well, I think many people would have said this is absolutely understandable, <laughs> but still. But you two have been friends. You've known each other for years. You both cooperated on the biography, as did Harold himself. How did all that come about? Well, from my point of view, it came about in a very interesting way. I went back to the Guardian office many years ago now, and uh, in my pigeonhole was a letter from Robert McCrum at Faber, saying, would I like to have lunch with him and Harold Pinter to discuss a short book on Harold Pinter's politics? Obviously, I said yes. We met, I think, in Holland Park, actually, um, the restaurant there. And this very pleasant, charming lunch suddenly grew. Uh, and Harold at one point leant forward and said, of course, Michael, you're quite free to interview anyone you like to talk about my life. And I suddenly realised a short book about politics had become an open invitation to write about Harold's life. I couldn't quite believe it, actually. I'd come to the lunch expecting a short book, and I left the lunch happily commissioned to write a long book. Right. And, and did, you and already, did you already know Harold at that stage? Very marginally and edgily, to be quite truthful. I mean, Harold and I had one or two little sort of little uh, flurries, you know, uh, together. But I remember he was always, he was, as we both know, very gracious. I remember coming to interview him one night um, in his study at the back of your house, and he gave me a copy of a play of his called One for the Road, and he inscribed it in saying, you didn't care for it, but what the hell? <laughs> and I thought, that's a very charming thing to write. And he was, we both know this. Mm -hmm. uh, a and very you, loyal and forgiving man, actually. And you cooperated, obviously, as well. Well, it, it, the back story, Michael knows this, but he didn't know it for some time, and I think he was slightly shocked. The back story is that a biographer, who shall be nameless, suddenly announced to Harold that he was going to write a biography of him, and he said, although I'm known for writing political biography, I actually take a mild interest in the theatre, and I thought I'd write a biography of you, and could you give me your parents' address in Brighton. Um, and Harold 
was, gracious as he was, extremely angry about this. It was the mention of his parents, the idea they'd put up with a lot from the press, and the idea that somebody would just go and call on them. And uh, um, he said, oh, what do we do? And I said, oh, it's quite simple. I tell you how you make absolutely sure that there's no biography. Um, you ask Michael Billington, he's far too busy. Um, he's very good, interesting, conscientious man. But he's far too busy, he's writing every night. You then say to everybody, no, you can't do it because there's an authorized biography of Michael Billington, end of subject. <laughs> Except it wasn't. <laughs> there we go. Um, and you'd hoped to shut him up, but you didn't. <laughs> no, no, I wanted to shut up the other person, which I did, uh, or rather I wanted to soothe Harold. And the result was something which uh, uh, um, I completely endorse and much admire. I, I should say that once I was commissioned to write the book, um, both Harold and Antonia could not have been more helpful. I mean, Harold sort of was extremely, extremely generous with his time and interviews. I would go to that study at sort of 5.30 or 5 o'clock in the evening and talk for a couple of hours before his supper. And he allowed me to talk to all his friends. And Antonia, equally, was incredibly generous. And one of the great things you did, I remember, was to show me the actual genealogy of the Pinter family, the, you know, the strictly accurate record of where the Pinters came from, because there's a myth they were Sephardic Jews from uh, Portugal or Spain. And Antonio gave me the absolute uh, accurate version of events, as an historian would. Well, it actually, uh, um, it's nice of Michael to put it like that, but what happened when I got to know Harold's parents, um, I was very interested in where Harold, this amazing genius, came from. And they, because... They were both born in this country in 1902 and 1904, but their own parents, Harold's grandparents, were um, immigrants from Odessa, three from Odessa and one from Poland nearby. And I was able to track it and, and really find out about it. And actually, I wrote it all down. And then I don't think Harold, he, he, you know, he liked the idea that the ship that sailed with Columbus was called the Pinto and no doubt <laughs> largely crewed by Pintos. You know, it, it didn't, wasn't really his area of interest. Um, but of course Michael was interested, so it was a marvellous chance I was able to give it to. Well, we are claiming Harold Pinter as our own in Chiswick because it's the Chiswick Book Festival. But Michael, your book really explains how important Chiswick, the Chiswick High Road flat and the caretaker were. So t tell us how that came about. Well, very briefly, I mean, we know that Harold lived at 373 Jizik High Road, first floor flat, with his then wife, Vivian, and their son, Daniel. And I was talking to Harold about uh, his plays, and we were talking about The Caretaker. And he suddenly came out with a story, which I swear no one had he'd not told to anyone uh, before, or not to anyone, not anyone writing, anyway, um, which was, very briefly, uh, flat was owned by a rather unseen landlord who came and went. It was looked after by a handyman whose real name was Austin, in the play he's called Aston, who'd had some kind of mental problems. And one day, Austin, Aston, invites a tramp or a homeless man to come and stay. And this man stays for four months, or sorry, four weeks. The, the key part of the story is this. Harold says one day he was coming down the stairs from his first floor flat and looked through an open door and this was an image of the Austin figure standing with his back to the door looking out of the window onto the garden and the tramp with a duffel bag putting all his possessions into it in a sort of panic, obviously being given orders to quit. And it was that image that Harold was arrested by and that was the germ of the caretaker. What was going on? What was the relationship between these two men? And it's a very interesting example of how Harold's imagination worked. I mean, that single image, you or I might have gone past that door and thought, how interesting. For Harold, it was the key that unlocked the play. And that was a story he told me. And it's, it's, it's a rich story, I think. Absolutely. And then he met the tramp later in the Chiswick Roundabout. He met the yeah. tramp yeah. later, yes, in the Chiswick High Road, I think, yeah. actually. Um, not telling him you know, that he, he was the centrepiece of a play. I mean, Harold was always keen to make the point that the starting point for his plays was often an image or a phrase, but then his imagination took over. So the three figures in the play are not remotely like, well, certainly two of them are not remotely like um, the actual 
sources. I mean, he said that the tramp was not this sort of uh, uh, aggressive, you know, uh, fierce, dogmatic figure that uh, Davis becomes in the play. I, I, I quite agree with it, Michael. Harold always, I mean, my experience in what he talked about, it was always an image. Um, and there was this image, I mean, for instance, um, No Man's Land, he was, Harold said he was sitting in a taxi and he suddenly heard someone say, I mean, in his imagination, as it is, and another person said, absolutely as it is, which are in fact the opening lines of Hurst and Spooner in No Man's Land. But when he got home, he thought, I must explore this. And as he would tell it, he let them, you know, he let them take him on a kind of journey. So I think he, he was very keen to make the point that there would be an image, but then it took off and that he didn't life, uh, write from life. Would you agree? I would that? agree absolutely with that, yes. I mean, there was, the starting point was often an experience, yes. a memory, an image, a story had been told, but then that would be transmuted into something else. And I think the... I, my theory is I think the further Harold went on, the, the, the further he got from using... Uh, his own biographical experience. If you go back to the very beginning, the birthday party, the very first major play, that starts from a memory of being in some tatty digs in Eastbourne when Harold was a working yeah. actor and, and having to spend a night in a, sharing a room with another guy who was also uh, in the digs and said he was a concert pianist and Harold couldn't understand why this man was living in you know, these awful, depressing digs if he was a concert pianist. He had once been a pianist. And then Harold found the next morning at breakfast, this other guy was being goosed by the landlady, who was obviously very racious. Well, I mean, you know, that you can see is all there in the birthday party. But I think as, as, as Harold goes on, I mean, uh, there are differing degrees to which the plays are triggered by an actual experience. Mm. But I think some of the later plays get further from uh, actual known events. But it was the caretaker that absolutely, you say, catapulted him into, into fame. The birthday party had happened and had been, a, I mean, had closed after eight oh, days. Six, well, I think six, six days. That's six right. days. So what, what happened with the caretaker that night and how big was it? Well, there's a very interesting point. I mean, my theory is this. I mean, there was two years between the two plays. Uh, the birthday party, Lyric Hammersmith, 1958, caretaker, arts theatre, two years later, almost exactly two years later. But in those two years, Harold had been incredibly uh, prolific and productive. You know, he'd become known uh, through television plays. We forget now, his plays were often done on um, uh, ATV, as it then was, you know, and it would appear after Sunday night at the London Palladium. So a play like A Night Out, you know, would gain a huge uh, viewing figure. The birthday party had been seen on, as, on television in a sensational production by Joan Kemp Welch, again in early 1960. Radio plays had appeared, A Slight Ache, on Radio 3, and so on. And there was a growing momentum, I think, amongst critics. There had been a, a profound injustice done uh, over the birthday party, and therefore uh, there was a need to assess this writer carefully and properly, and of course, and of course, the caretaker is a very good play. That also helps. But it had an absolute, absolute rave reviews that uh, that, that week. And, and just w w one very interesting thing about that: the big event that week, supposedly, was a production of Ionesco's *Rhinoceros* at the Royal Court, directed by Orson Welles and starring Laurence Olivier. And this was meant to be the the, you know, the, the big event of the week. And come the Sundays, particularly, the caretaker is given maximum space, and Rhinoceros, which was a terrible production, is sort of put to the margins. So Harold, in that sense, triumphed over Orson Welles and Laurence Olivier. So it had a very quick transfer, and, transfer, and then it ran and ran. It ran for well, it like over 400 performances, I think, at the, at the, uh, at the Duchess Theatre, wasn't it? Yes. Of course, it had a very good cast, including somebody who lived in Chiswick, uh, Donald Pleasance, and... Uh, uh, he writes and you write and uh, Harold talks about um, getting a lift home from B Donald uh, back to Chiswick. Well, so. Donald told me this story and I've never verified it that he, he, he said after rehearsals Harold would give him a lift back or I, I forget who or perhaps I'd show a cab I'm not quite sure and when Harold was dropped at his house or the flat Donald looked up and said I know that flat I used to go there to have my photograph taken. There was an Indian photographer with a beautiful coloured wife. And Donald Pleasant was convinced that was why Davis is always going on in the play, if you remember, about the blacks in this sort of racist, xenophobic way. So Donald thinks it was because the house was once, you know, 
occupied. I mean, I've never checked that out, but I take Donald's word for it. Harold, of course, was an actor as well as a playwright, and he actually took over uh, the part of Mick when Alan Bates went off to film, I think it was Whistle Down the Wind. Is that, is that right? That is right, yes. I mean, I didn't see Harold uh, in that play, but Harold was a formidable actor, I would say. And had he not been a great playwright, you know, he, could, he could have been a very fine actor. And he remained an actor. Mm. I mean, he, he, he took a gap a few 17 years, but when Michael Gambon couldn't go to um, the United States with old times, having a very successful production in, at the Haywood, um, we were actually in Venice, and Harold took a call, and he said... Um, I'll think about it. Yes, I've thought about it. Yes. Um, and I said, mildly curious, what was that? He said, oh, uh, we're going to America and I'm going to act in old times. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Looking out at Venice and a few happy gondolas. Um, and after 17 years, he went on, on stage, beginning, the American tour began to try out at St. Louis. And um, it would be the night the cards against the Reds or something like that. And all the husbands were in subscription tickets. Um, I mean, it, nowadays they'd be on their phones, you know, but they were all absolutely furious. They wanted to be watching and were trying to listen to the radio results. And the wives sat there being very charming. And then we moved to Los Angeles. Uh, Lee Vollman um, and Nicola Paget, And we lived there for three months and would have transferred to San Francisco, but leave or some, or she had something else to do. Is it difficult for a playwright to be an actor in their own plays? Do they always think they could do it better? Or No, I don't think he felt that at all. I just think, as Michael has said, that he was an actor, and he thought it was a jolly good part. <laughs> but he had a heavyweight presence on stage. I mean, I remember yes. he played Hurst in yes. No Man's Land at the Almeida, part Ralph Richardson that famously played. Um, and Harold brought to it a sort of I don't, what, weight, presence, power, really. Um, he had extraordinary authority on stage. I could see him actually as King Lear. I don't think he ever did play it, but I mean, he, you know, had he, been, had he been in training you know, for Shakespeare, that would have been his range, I, I suspect. He, he always said to me that if he hadn't been a playwright, you know, that things hadn't turned out well, he thought his acting career would have taken off the odour he got, which seems to rather agree yes. with you. Uh, that as a character actor, he would have done better. But he played Goldberg on television. Yes. Um, I do remember one slightly comic episode. You may remember this. We were all in Turin when Harold was picking up the European Theatre Prize, and we were all sitting around at the dinner table having a very festive evening. And Michael Gambon, who was always very mischievous, wasn't he? Lent, lent across to Harold and said, Harold, I'd like to ask you something. And Harold said, what? He said, Harold, you're an actor. Why do you always play sinister parts? <laughs> I mean, Harold did not mind this question at all. Um, but he did actually get associated with sinister parts, didn't he? I he mean, did, because I said he had this sort of dark, brooding presence on screen or on stage. Actually, yeah. was very effective. Mm -hmm. So the caretaker was 1960. This was long before um, he met you, Antonio. I mean, it was 15 years, and you've written about um, your life together in, in, in Must You Go. Um, you wrote um, about that. Uh, you met him at a dinner party hosted by your brother-in-law, Kevin Billington, who is no relation, I don't, I don't, yeah, I no, don't think. Sadly. But how did that come about? How did you meet Harold? Um, my brother-in-law was a director, Kevin Billington, no relation, married to my sister, Rachel, the novelist. And um, he was doing a production of the birthday party, as it happened. And we were asked to go to the first night and we had some other engagement. It's very odd, these peculiar things, you know. Um, but I wanted to please my brother-in-law and sister and I was, you know, I liked very much. And so I said, oh, we'll go, we'll chuck the other one. And um, Hugh, my then husband, who was an MP, rushed off immediately off to the theatre because he had go to his constituency or something. And I went to dinner with the Billingtons up the road, almost Chiswick, uh -huh. um, Addison Avenue. And I sat nowhere near Harold and then very nice neighbors invited me to have a lift home to my house, which is in Camden Hill Square. 
And I said, oh, would I'd love a lift, I've got to, you know. And this, I said, but just hang on. I haven't said hello to Harold Pinter. Uh, just hang on. So they hung on, Richard and Viv King. And I went up to Harold, who was sitting, and I said, wonderful play, wonderful acting, you know, it all marvellous direction, marvellous. I'm afraid I must go. And he looked up with those extraordinary black eyes and said, must you go? And I thought, Sainsbury's, take children to school, write Charles II. <laughs> no, it's not absolutely essential. And on that, the whole of my life depended, but of course we didn't know. We then continued to talk. Finally, my charming neighbors got fed up. <laughs> and that was the beginning of our romance. So it was literally must you go. And you stayed on, outstaying your welcome, I think, with Kevin and... Very much outstaying my welcome. I think it was general outstaying of the welcome. <laughs> but anyway. And that was, and the rest was... Uh... The rest is in my book, Must You Go. <laughs> Which you must read, indeed, absolutely. And of course, it became a huge cause celeb. The tabloid press were uh, everywhere. Ridiculous. And so I mean, on. It, was, it was huge. Two middle-aged, we were 42 and 44, two middle-aged writers. Uh, um, ridiculous. It would seem ridiculous now. We weren't pop stars, you know. We weren't Beyonce. But you were both very famous in your own right, very distinguished, and there were all sorts of overtones and, and so on. You can see, I mean, as a journalist, uh, I mean, one can understand why people were interested, but then, of course, you've got photographers coming out of the bushes. And... Um, it's probably good for the soul to have journalists flocking round your um, doorstep <laughs> and asking you idiotic questions. But uh, <laughs> didn't feel that way at the time, perhaps. <laughs> no. Yeah. But anyway, after that, we had 33 very happy years together, yeah. which was nearly twice as long as our previous marriages. It was really wonderful. Okay. And um, so I was quite right not to go. <laughs> you actually stayed, or he actually stayed with Donald Pleasance at one point with, 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 uh, with their son in Chiswick. I don't know how long that, w that was for. It's quite brief, but I yeah. remember going there. It was, it was just off the river, wasn't just, it? Just down by the Bull's Head pub, yes. I think, actually, the house next Lovely, door. Lovely, very which nice I now know. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I liked it very much. So you have a few memories of Chiswick with Harold? Many, yeah. many. I mean, yeah. lots of friends. And and isn't there something called the boat race? There is something called the boat race. Come down, you and Harold would have come down to the uh, towpath because there's a lovely pub at the Bell and Crown because Harold would play cricket in Gunnersbury Park. Yes. And I think then all the cricketers would come down to the towpath and drink in the Bell and Crown. Absolutely so true. He took his, his cricket team, which was a roving side, was called Gaieties, founded by Lupino Lane, who owned the Gaieties Theatre. And... Um, he used to have a uh, match against the Guardian at Gunnersbury, yeah. and lovely ground, I must say. And then we would adhere to the <laughs> uh, to the crown. That's right. Well, I knew we couldn't talk about Harold Pinter without talking about cricket. So since we've we've raised it, I mean, why was he so obsessed with it? I mean, I mean, it was part of, a very important part of his life, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, his second evacuation. His first was to Cornwall, to Carhaix Castle. His second was to Yorkshire. And then I think, by his own account, he fell in love with Len Hutton and cricket in that, that order. Yes. Um, it was a golden age, don't forget, wasn't it, of cricket? The, uh, <coughs> particularly in that post-war period. Um, mm. Dennis Compton, you yeah, know, absolutely. at, at yes, Lord, played the, uh, round the corner. And there's yeah. a wonderful yeah. uh, uh, tribute by Harold to that. What is that sentence? I haven't got it exactly. I saw... Yeah, can I say it? Cause yeah. I, cause it yeah. um, this was a, a very fine lyric poem, As Long as Paradise Lost, which goes as far as, I saw Len Hutton in his prime, another time, another time. He then sent it to his great friend, Simon Gray, um, who he sent everything to. And being Harold, he rang him up the next day and, and, and to say, what did you think? And Simon said, I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> <laughs> But it's also That's somewhere true. a tribute. It's, got, it's a very simple sentence. It's, I saw Dennis Compton play score 70 last night in the sunshine at Lord's. You know, it's just a perfectly yeah. um, lifluous English sentence that brings exactly. in all those memories, Compton, yeah. Yeah. Lord's, the English summer, etc. Yeah. I think Harold, well, I mean, it, 
I mean, there were lots of reasons, I think, why he loved cricket. A lot of people in the theatre, don't forget, mm. do love cricket. Yeah. This is not uncommon. Samuel Beckett, another Nobel Prize winner. Absolutely, who comes in wisdom. Who's in wisdom, the cricketer's almanac. Really? Um, you know, Terence Rattigan, David Hare, Tom Stoppard. I mean, Absolutely. I can't think of many dramatists, in fact, who are not cricket lovers. Yeah. I think it's something to do with the fact that <clears throat> cricket, like drama, um, has a subtext. In other words, in cricket, there is always something going on. It looks like a sort of gentlemanly English game, doesn't it? People in white flannels <laughs> in the sun. But underneath is a, is a rigorous battle going on, obviously, yes, be between yes. batsman and bowler. Yeah. And also, I think it's very like the theatre, because cricket is both an individual combat and a team game. So you've got bowler mm. versus batsman, and at the same time, you've got 11 people, you know, mm. competing against another 11 people. I mean, there's lots of other reasons. I think there's a ritual element to, to cricket that appeals to many people who love the theatre. Mm. I think that's very interesting, and I, I, I completely understand what you say. And, and about playwrights, at um, one point, in Harold, in his uh, team against The Guardian, um, Harold, there was Tom Stoppard, who always kept wicked, mm -hmm. whatever the significance, brilliantly, Simon Gray, yes. and Ronnie Howard. They are, so you yes. two have, they were all foremost playwrights. There's a the picture time. in your book of um, Harold and Tom Stoppard oh, yes. wearing his traditional red gloves, <laughs> trademark right. red gloves, I think it's. Yeah. But there's a wonderful phrase of Harold's about the hidden violence of cricket, and I've always thought that was a very pregnant phrase. The hidden violence of cricket, as I say, underneath the surface is a, is a real ferocious combat. Mm. And Harold, as you know better than I do, took the gaieties very very seriously. I mean, it wasn't just a sort of weekend, uh, you know, knockabout. For Harold, it was, it was life or death, wasn't it? Why are you telling me that? <laughs> well, no, I tell you, you know better than I do, actually. <laughs> I haven't said you to my verse this. about Harold and cricket, have I? <laughs> I will. But you <laughs> spent some lovely times watching cricket, didn't you? Oh, no, I, yeah. uh, um, it was absolutely a um, wonderful coincidence. My father, Frank Longford, adored cricket. And he was the kind of little boy who knew wisdom by heart. And my early memories, pre-war, my parents' Sussex house were teams, and my father bringing a team against the village. So I grew up with all of that. How you learn the rules of cricket, I don't know, but I knew them. And there was a wonderful cricketer called Aidan Crawley, who's a great friend of my father. My father told myself and my brother Thomas, he's 12th man for England. And we got completely the wrong end of the stick. And we thought that that was the best, you see. <laughs> and so uh, we kept asking people, are you 12th man? And they looked wrong. <laughs> no, so I, I loved it. Uh, that's lovely. That's very like the go-between, of course, which um, Harold um, adapted, I think, did he yes, not, for, the, for the screen. as a wonderful cricket. And you've caught me out and all of those, uh, th those bits. But your father, you've mentioned your father, um, Lord Longford. Um, they didn't really approve of your relationship in the first place but got to... Uh, I want to be completely accurate. Uh, they did not approve um, in the first instance, but they became devoted to Harold. And my mother came on summer holiday with us for 15 years. Um, and my father paid Harold the ultimate compliment, which was asking him to lunch in the House of Lords. She normally only did for reform criminals. <laughs> Harold is the only known person. He never asked any of his other sons in law. And um, he was very proud of Harold and he introduced him to lots of people. This is my son in law, the, the playwright, you know, the House of Lords, Will, you know, nodded solemnly. And then um, he, he sort of thought he wanted to do right by him. So he said, Now you'll have some port. Well, Harold never drank port. Um, so he said, yes, yes, and then the port came, and um, Harold said, oh, you, you know about these things, um, what is it? And Harold said, Dow 69, and he asked the waiter, what is it? And the waiter said, Dow 69. So when I was told this story, I said, how on earth did you know? So you never, he said, it's the only port I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they got on. Yeah. The press, um, again, right at the start, made much of the differences between the two of you, the East, East End boy and the aristocratic... I think by the time you're in your 40s, um, as I say, I was 42 and Harold was 44, I, I don't think 
I mean, I think the rules of the British aristocracy are you sort of, it stops at the main stem. I don't think I was, could rightly be described as aristocrat. And Harold was such a famous playwright that I think East End Boy was a bit... I mean, I think that was just the press, really. Yes, but I, again, it's an obvious one. It, it's an untoward. And since we're in, in a church, obviously there was a deli- difference in the religion as well. He had no real faith and you were a Catholic. And... Um, Harold was a thousand percent Jewish and did bar mitzvah and was extremely proud of being Jewish, but abandoned the Jewish religion. So he had no religion, formal religion as such. I was and am a Catholic. There was never any problem at all. You know, when, if we were in Italy, he would come to churches. And you have to remember that T.S. Eliot was probably his favorite poet, you know. I mean, I think, um, if I say he was a broad church, you know, you know, I don't think he, I mean, he would have utterly disapproved of the idea that because he wasn't a Christian, he couldn't read Eliot. He loved Eliot. Um, and in fact, we had, as Michael will remember, we had Eliot read, do you remember, I at, do, at, yes, at yes. his funeral? Yes. Yes. I, I mean, which is just what he would have wanted. And uh, I, I mean, you talk about sitting in churches and, uh, uh, and so on. He likes the lights out, you like the lights on. Yes, he'd come to midnight mass with me, so uh, it, it, it was never an issue. I mean, what would have happened if we'd had children, we'll never know, because um, it was too late for that. Michael, back to your book. I mean, there was one big scoop in it, which was the whole betrayal scoop about the affair with, with Joan Bakewell, which, again, was a long time before um, he, he met Ant- Antonia. Um, that was a big sort of um, revelation at the time. Yes, I didn't realise when I was doing the book... Uh, quite how, how much it would be seized upon. I mean, basically, simply what happened was I went to interview Joan Bakewell because you know, I knew she'd uh, worked with Harold and then Harold. Um, and about halfway through our conversation, um, she said to me, Michael, I don't think I can carry on answering your questions without telling you a basic fact. And then she said, Harold and I had this seven-year-long relationship. Um, and I think you ought to know about it. I absorbed this. I took it in. I didn't press her a, a great deal upon it. But... I put this into the book. I realized later that obviously she and Harold had agreed you know, that I, she should uh, give this information to me. It wasn't that she was doing it behind his back. He thought, you know, better to be honest, um, if Michael's going to do the book, then he needs to know the facts. Um, and I mean, obviously it was relevant to betrayal because betrayal is a play about uh, adultery amongst many other things. Um, Harold was very insistent, though, that uh, the relationship with Joan Baker was the starting point for the play, but it wasn't the play. In other words, the play is not a literal transcription of their relationship, uh, uh, and it becomes, as he argued, a much wider play, you know, about all forms of betrayal, self-betrayal, betrayal of your career, betrayal of your own integrity, apart from, mere, apart from a simple sexual betrayal. Um, Harold, I mean, he, he was very interesting. I did talked to him a good deal about this. And I remember saying to him, as a writer, do you have any moral compunctions about using an experience like this before you sit down to write? And he paused and he said, no. He said that you have moral compunctions after you have finished the play. And I thought it was a very interesting point. He said, while you are writing, the creative urge is paramount and that takes you over. Um, the moral questions and should you have revealed this only come later. But Harold, I think, did not feel any guilt about this because it wasn't, an, it wasn't a play about his affair with Joan Bakewell. And there are lots of divergences between you know, fact and, and fiction. It was a play about the nature, as I say, of, of disloyalty to uh, other people and to yourself. Yes, I, uh, and uh, there's one enormously important element in the play which was completely absence from reality, and I agree with what Michael said, that is, the play is very much about non-homoerotic male friendship. Don't you agree? Absolutely. It's very important. And Harold simply didn't have that relationship with Joe Beckwell's husband, you know. I mean, no, I mean Michael well, Beckwell was not his best friend. No. Um, he was a producer who worked with... Uh, uh, yes. It, 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 it's irrelevant. It, it right. simply didn't have that. I understand, that. Yeah. And so, it, it, it again... We get back to the image, the image of the child being thrown up in the kitchen 
and, and you know, amuse the child, which it comes throughout the play. It was the image um, which started him on it, rather than anything else. And who was throwing uh, the original image was? Um, it was Harold in, in, in a, in a, at a party, I think, throwing Joan's young child yeah. up in the air. But he also, Harold also said, he, he, he started with this image of two people in a pub who had obviously had a relationship, you know, meeting after several years. And that, again, triggered his imagination. Yeah. It's, a, it's a difficult area to be precise about because different people have subjective responses to this play, you know, and particularly those involved. But Harold was adamant to me. He said, you know, this play, it may have a starting point in reality, but it is a play, it's a piece of drama. He, he, we obviously very much together when he was writing it. And um, I remember um, he, yes, it was his play, not someone else's story. He, he felt very strongly about it. Funny, I think it's the one time you mentioned Michael, Michael Billington's book in, your, in your, your own book, saying, Michael Billington biography, colon, press her in a tizzy about the revelation of Harold's affair with Joan Bakewell in the 60s. Well, that was accurate. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the only embarrassing bit of this, not the only, but the embarrassing bit for me, and I know Antonio doesn't like me going on about this, is I gave the play a stinking review I was going when to come it to... first appeared, actually. I, um, and I've spent my life having to do a mea culpa and saying, look, I was wrong, I was wrong, you know, this is a tremendous play. I think you've been to Canossa and back about <laughs> seven times, <laughs> barefoot. But why didn't you like it in the first place? Um, why? I think it was because it, the mood of the times was very much, and I was very uh, keen on political plays, plays that were mm. directly political, plays that were going to change society, plays that were dealing with you know, current realities. And here, on the surface, and it was only on the surface, was a play about middle class adultery, you know, Hampstead literati. And I thought, no, 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 we've, we've done that, we don't need this subject anymore. I think also, to be strictly accurate, the play had a less than happy baptism. Um, it, it, it opened at the National Theatre. The, the was, it was in the middle of a period when the National Theatre had strikes. Uh, the production, I thought, hadn't really had time to mm. settle in. Uh, and I, in those days, uh, it was done with a revolt. John Berry's set had revolved. Mm. So each scene, you know, had to be mm. trundled around on the revolve. Nowadays, the play is staged much more simply and much more directly. Mm. But I think it was my imperception as well. Mm. Uh, you know, this wasn't a play that fitted the mood of the times. I was wrong, and I admit mm. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I, 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 <laughs> Back from Canossa, <laughs> but I, I think you're well, absolutely right. When I first saw the play done simply without an interval, the original had an interval, and there's no interval in no, that play. Absolutely not. You know, uh, um, I mean, Peter Hall, which was the National, had an interval, um, and then we went to, um, I think it was Leeds, where there was a quite small theatre, and they did it right through very, very simply, and um, it was a revelation. And the recent production, did you see I Tom Hiddleston? Extraordinary. Yeah, it, was, well, it's a, it was just amazing, yeah, I think. Was, no, and and it were three amazing actors. Tom, Tom Hiddleston? And, uh, yeah. Yes, Tom Hiddleston. Yeah. Uh, done with a minimalist <coughs> set. Yeah. Oh, and, almost no yeah. set, actually. And Zavi Ashton, I thought, was absolutely mm. wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Now, of course, Harold was a very distinguished screenwriter as well. He wrote the um, screenplay of Betrayal, amongst other things, but there's French lieutenant's uh, woman. That, I mean, he got Oscar nominations and so mm -hmm. on. Was there a difference, do you think, in Harold the screenwriter and Harold the playwright? Or? Well, well, great difference in, in his working habit. If he was doing a screenplay, which would be on commission, I mean, he never did a screenplay on spec. Mm -hmm. It was work, and he sat down and he did it. Whereas, as I've said, with a play, yes. it would be an image. And with a play, he mm. might work all night. I remember when he was writing Celebration, his last play. Um, we were in Dorset, a lovely house we used to rent. We went up to bed. Five minutes later, I heard a noise. I said, what are you doing? He was swinging out of bed. He said, it's that waiter. He won't let me sleep. He went back and continued to write the play. That was never like that with a screenplay. No, there's another big difference as well. Of course, the uh, screenplays were al almost entirely adaptations of other of people's, people's work, in actually. Entirely, rather... weren't they? Hmm? Entirely. Well, yes. Uh, uh, betrayal was his. Uh, well, yeah, yes, yeah. Betrayal was... was yeah. But, uh, you know, they came from other sources mm. rather than being original, yeah. original ideas of Harold. So they had a different origin. So there was... He had... Uh, 
the damages obligation both to the his source but also the obligation to uh, the viewer, you know, to make um, entertaining viewing. I mean, one thing I remember Harold was very adamant about, he, he hated films with first person narration. Yes. And he would always, and in accident, in the original novel, you know, it starts as a first person narrative, Harold would always say, no, that's not how, you, not how it works on screen. I think he was a very brilliant screenwriter. And I think because his plays are so famous, they somewhat slightly overshadow his contribution to cinema, which mm. I, I think was mm. enormous. I mean, there were the three great films, as you well know, with Joseph Losey, uh, The Servant, Accident, and The Go-Between. Go yeah. But there were many fine later films. And what is fascinating, <clears throat> I think, about the films is how one of his big uh, projects was the Proust screenplay, which, of course, was never uh, mm. made into a movie. But I think working on Proust, as he did for, what, a, a year at least... A year of his life, it was before we met, but he said... A affected his perspective when it came to writing plays, but also when it came to writing film scripts. I think the scripts after post Proust, mm. as it were, mm. um, are very much more about uh, the process of making something. Um, the French Lieutenant's Woman yes. you know, is partly that, isn't it? It's not just about the Victorian story, it's about how you encase that story. Uh, the Last Tycoon is also about the film making process. So uh, after Proust, mm. the films have a di slightly different yeah. texture, I think. Because uh, um, if you think think of it, the French lieutenant's woman had the alternative, the, the reality, yeah, yeah. present yeah, day, yeah, yeah. Um, and the idea was Carol Rice, who was directing it. How do we solve this? Um, but 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 all the dialogue and working it out was Harold, mm. and I think that's what makes the film so good. I love that film. Yes, there are a couple of Harold's films. One of which is well known, the other is not, and I think they deserve much more acknowledgement. One of his, my, one of my favourite films, The Quilla Memorandum. Yes, and it, it belongs to that period when people were making films about Berlin, you know, the Len Dayton period, if you mm. like. I think The Quilla Memorandum is the, is much the best of that genre of Berlin so, spy yeah. movies. Wasn't that Harold's first film? I think it wasn't the first. I think he had done. I think mm. the the servant had been had sure? come before. I think so, but I'll have no, to yeah. check. Mm. Um, and there's another film written, uh, or shown originally on television and hardly seen, called The Heat of the Day, yeah. based on a novel by Elizabeth Bowen. Uh, it was shown on television at some absurd time, like sort of Boxing Day, you know, midnight, uh, and had a minimal viewing figure. Yeah. And if anyone looks at it today, I think they'll see it's a, it's a masterpiece, actually. I, 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 I have a, the agreeable habit of showing Harold's films, the ones that people don't know, at a little private cinema at the Soho Hotel. Yeah. And um, you obviously didn't come to the heat of the I day. I didn't know. Um, but it, it, everybody c couldn't understand it was why it did not be better known. That's very interesting. Um, yeah. It was Michael York, yeah, right. yeah. Um, Michael Gambon. Patricia Hodge. And Patricia Hodge. Yeah. And it's a film about a woman who, <laughs> in the war, um, is having an affair with someone who may or may not be a German spy. Yeah. And Michael Gambon is the uh, person who has to shadow her and track her and mm. see, you know, and try and warn her about the danger she's getting into. Mm. But the Gambon figure in the process becomes hypnotized by uh, Patricia Hodge and falls in love with her. Yes. It's a rich and complicated story and an extraordinary evocation of yeah, right. wartime London. Mm. Right. We, 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 we will get the word out there in that Good. case. We'll find and there's we another one, yeah. Langrish Godard, oh, yes. mm -hmm. which has um, Judy Dench and Jeremy Irons as a job it takes place in Ireland. It's absolutely so I, I can see a season brilliant. forgotten films of Harold Pinter. Well, well the, the, good the, idea. Yes, yeah. Reunion is another yeah, fine yeah. one about a friendship yes, I showed reunion. Between, between, yeah. between two young men yeah. um, in Germany mm. in the 1930s. Mm. Now we can't talk about Harold Pinter without talking about politics and hum, hum, human rights. Um, mm. It was obviously a huge part of him. I mean, what, what do you remember about that, that side of him? I know you had disagreements on politics. We didn't have many disagreements mm. uh, on politics because I grew up in a Labour household. My father was a member of the Labour government, married a Conservative MP, so I was aware that there were more than one opinion on almost every subject. Um, I would say we agreed on most things politically. But he um, was very outspoken, wasn't he, and got yes. angry with people, and I don't think you did that. Uh -huh. No, but, but then I didn't write plays either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I think, I mean, before we met, 
Peggy Ashcroft, who was a great friend of his, he much admired and had been in his play, Landscape, um, got him interested in Chile and all that kind of drama. I think she was the first person who really interested him in politics. Do, do you think that? I mean, yours was meant to be a short yes. book about politics. It was indeed, yes, yes. So, yeah. I mean, Harold politics, it's a big subject, obviously, and uh, I mean, for years, Harold, many years when he was married to Vivian, would disclaim an interest in politics. And yet, when you look back at the early plays he wrote, mm. they obviously have a strong political edge. You can't see the birthday party now without thinking in political terms. Yes. He wrote a play called The Hot House, which was initially put in a, in a drawer and forgotten, but actually is a directly political play. So the political instinct, if you like, was always there in Harold, yes. it seems to me. It becomes articulate, as you say, once he... Friendship with Peggy Ashcroft, friendship with David Mercer, I suspect, was another yes. uh, thing. Mm -hmm. that but he wasn't a politician. Started. I mean, he was a mm -hmm. writer who was interested in politics, not mm -hmm. a politician. But he had an, you know this very well, an uncompromising yes. uh, view of the truth. And yeah. I miss his voice on politics, amongst many other mm -hmm. things, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, he would speak. I mean, you know, what he would make of our current situation, um, beggars believe, yeah. actually. Absolutely. I might go on to that, but <laughs> it was 15 years ago that he won the Nobel Prize. Yes. He couldn't, uh, he was too ill to go to Stockholm uh, to receive it, but he um, gave his speech in a Channel 4 studio, right. and he, he really let rip. I mean, the whole text is in your book, yes. isn't it? But, I mean, he, he, he laid into the Americans. He was in hospital, um, and uh, in... Um, the Marsden, and I took him in a private ambulance to the studio, which was just off the embankment, and he was in a red blanket, and he looked older and sicker. I didn't know how he could possibly do it. And then he sat on the stage, like this stage, um, with you know, to do the television, and I sat over there, and I could look at the screen. And when I looked at him, he looked older than Noah ever looked. When I looked at the screen, he grew and he became Harold and he did this amazing speech. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the delivery was extraordinary, but the content, I think, is very important. Yes, absolutely. Because what it's saying in a nutshell is truth is indivisible. He said the, the role of the artist, obviously, is, and the dramatist specifically, is to search for the truth and to tell the truth. And he said we have to apply that rigorous search for truth to our public life as well, to, our, you know, to public politics. And that was, that was his great message and the theme yes. of that lecture. And I, th I think it still is a very stirring lecture. Mm. I was in Stockholm. I actually went to the ceremony, although sadly Harold couldn't. And I remember the, the, um, the speech was relayed to a group of young uh, yes. Swedes, actually, who all stood and cheered at the end of it uh, because they were so moved by it. Can I just add one little... Uh, Please postscript to this. Many years later, 2008, I, I did a production of two Pinter plays at Lambda, the drama school, yeah. and I added uh, a, a reading of the Pinter Nobel lecture, which Harold gave me permission to do. And we, we did it as a stage reading and divided up you know, the speech amongst the eight actors. And I suddenly realized it is drama as well as polemic actually people say it's a rant, it's not a rant, it's a very closely argued speech. Mm. And it was fascinating how it gave gained an extra life when spoken. i just add one more thing, and it's one of the most touching things I remember. Harold and Antonia had kindly agreed to come and see my Lambda Pinter well. evening. This was October 2008. It was a cold evening. You turned up early. You sat and waited. You watched the productions. Harold could not have been more gracious at the end. He stood up and congratulated the actors. You stayed behind. You talked to the cast and the crew. And then we went out afterwards, and I suddenly realized what it must have cost Harold to do this. He was a seriously ill man, as you know, at that he, time, he, wasn't he? He died in December. He died but, very, uh, very shortly after. Mm -hmm. and, but he'd made a commitment, hadn't he? But he also and he, he, loved he, he, actors. He loved and respected It was his honoring that commitment, though, that touched yes, me and moved me yeah, very much. No, that was typical. Mm. Harold would have been 90 in, Oct in, in October. When he was 60, you chaired a Radio 3 evening, uh, at Harold Pinter at 60, a birthday party. It just had Sir John Gielgud, Dame Peggy Ashcroft, Sir Peter Hall, David Jones, Arthur Miller, Samuel Rushdie, Dirtberg. I mean, yes. it's, it's a fabulous um, lineup of, uh, of things and a, and a proper celebration, including him, of him at 60. Yes, I haven't listened back to it, actually. 
I'm for sure a long we ought time. to try and get I'd it dug out of the yes, uh, dug out again. Yeah. But it, I mean, it occupied the whole of an evening on Radio 3, yeah. didn't it? It was something yes, like yeah. a sort of f- five hour yeah. event yeah. Uh, in the way that radio can be very good at you know, clearing the airwaves yeah, for absolutely. an important event. Yeah. So he would have been 90. I mean, um, some final thoughts from you about either what he would think of uh, life today or what we have missed or. Well, I, one final thought comes to me because I've just been reading an upcoming biography um, of Tom Stoppard by Hermione Lee, a very impressive book it is. And she talks about Stoppard and Pinter. And Tom Stoppard says something very uh, significant at one point. He says, most dramatists uh, do what we can as well as we can or as, you know, to the best of our ability, and, and that's what we are. He said, Harold Pinter is in a different category to the rest of us, because Harold Pinter, he says, like Beckett, like Joyce, redefined the medium he was working in. In other words, he says, Harold changed the rules of drama. And that's why for Tom Stoppard, Harold Pinter is on another plane. And I think that's a very good memory to cherish for Harold's 90th year. Thank you. Antonio? I think it's a wonderful memory. Um, uh, uh, My own, I will end by saying, um, first of all, he would, in a way, have enjoyed COVID because to be able to write and read, you know, um, except for one thing, guess what it is? No cricket. No, no, no. <laughs> Otherwise. And last thought, I, w- I wish he'd lived to 100. Of course. Antonio Fraser, Michael Billington, thank you very, very much. Thank indeed. you. Thank you. Thank you.